This is Thursday, August 31, 2018. We are at the Mary Ann Morse Rehab Center in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Richard Somersault. Welcome, Rich. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? July 28, 1925. And where were you born? At Leonard Moss Hospital in Natick. Right next door. Yeah. And do you currently live here at the Marianne Morse? Uh, 1956, we moved to Sherbin. Uh -huh. And do you currently live here at the Morse? The Marianne yeah. Morse? Okay. Yes. And your marital status? Widowed. Do you have children? Yes. One. Mm -hmm. And. Daughter. Okay. And do you have grandchildren? No. Now, I understand you lived in Natick as a child. Yes. And what part of Natick uh, did you grow up in? Right. And. The intersection of Park, uh, Park Avenue and Route 9, the Worcester Turnpike. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about growing up in that area? Yes, my best friend lived across Route 9, George Salou, and uh, in fact, his sister, Helen, lives right upstairs in this institution. Mm -hmm. and so what, uh, for example, you lived across the street from where is now the 9 and 27 Mall. Yes. What was there before that? Uh, route twenty, uh, route nine, was still a Worcester Turnpike, but there was trolley tracks in the center of the lanes. In fact, when we grew up in nineteen. 30, 31, mm -hmm. that was when they rebuilt the turnpike and laid down concrete. Now, Rich, do you remember the airport? Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. I remember, remember uh, Amelia Earhart and Clarence Chamberlain, who is a pilot, and several others I can't remember. For but those who are not familiar, there was an airport on Route 9, mm -hmm. and it was over at Wethersfield? Wethersfield Road, yes. yes. Which Wethersfield is mm -hmm. now. And there were two hangars with concrete floors, and I used to, George and I used to make model airplanes and fly them from the concrete. <laughs> that was after the mm -hmm. hangars were gone. And what did your parents do for a living? My father was uh, connected to New England Prestige Company mm -hmm. in Natick as a salesman and eventually vice president. And how about your mother? She never worked, but she was a homemaker. Mm -hmm. And did you have any brothers or sisters? 
I had one sister eight years older than I was, and she passed away years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, Rich, did you go to Natick schools? Yes, up to, I went through Coolidge Junior High School and then transferred to Huntington Prep School in Boston. Okay. And why did you do that? Mostly because of my dream of being accepted to MIT, which I was. Now, Rich, do you remember when Pearl Harbor was bombed in December 1941? Yes. And what were you doing that day? Going to school. Oh, that was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I was up in my bedroom studying when we heard about Pearl Harbor. And the next day, President Roosevelt gave a speech to Congress asking for a declaration of war. And we all, everyone at school heard it. But well, you were still too, a little too young to join, is that yes. correct? So you were, were you basically commuting from Natick to Boston? Yes. Okay. Boston, Worcester, bus lines every day. <laughs> and when did you graduate from Huntington? Uh, June of 1943. Uh -huh. And did your school take part in any wartime activities like bond drives or rationing? Uh, Yes, there was very, I can remember some rallies for mm -hmm. rationing, but I can't remember. That's okay. So you graduated. Were you called into the service or did you go to college? I was at that time, it was a bad time for any student. Mm -hmm. And I was 17 years old. And I joined the Marine Reserve in January of 1943. What made you choose the Marines? Stupidity. <laughs> no, I love the Marines. Mm -hmm. Did your father serve in World War I? No. no. He was too old, I guess, and married with a daughter. All right, so you joined the Marine Reserves in January 43. Yes. And did you then go into MIT? I went, I graduated in June of Huntington and I was accepted at MIT starting in January, July 1st. But the Marines called me to active duty on July 7th. So you were at MIT for about one week. Yes. Heating the call. All right, so tell us a little bit about what happened first. Uh, you took the oath and you went to basic? Yes. 
at Paris Island. Okay. And mostly was training at Camp Lejeune mm -hmm. and Quantico, Virginia. And and how did you like basic? I loved it. I loved it. At 17 years old, it was a, a dream. <laughs> did you receive any advanced training after basic? Yes. Oh, lots of <laughs> <laughs> how to kill mostly. All right, so you've completed basic, you've had your additional training. What happened next? We Marines sent me to Dartmouth College on a V-12 program and I took an accelerated course which accounted to two years of college in 10 months I think it was. Wow. Yeah. What were you studying? It, it was, of course, uh, the military in fact, geology was actually map reading and things like that. Okay. Meteorology. So what happened at the end of 10 months? I went to Camp Lejeune and basically accelerated picture program of leadership And I was very young and immature in those days. Yeah. Well, they seem to like you going into these accelerated programs. Yes. <laughs> what was the end result? The end result was Camp Pendleton mm -hmm. in California and then going overseas. to Guam. Uh -huh. And what was your rank at the time? Private first class. PFC, okay. Now you're in Guam. Yeah. Can you tell me what Guam was like? It was well, palm trees. Mm -hmm. Hot. <laughs> and insects and a lot of marines <laughs> and we were training basically for the invasion of Japan which was a very complicated thing that would look like D-Day multiplied by a hundred. Mm. So by the time you were on Guam, this was uh, late 44? About uh, around late 1944? 45. You're in 45, okay. Yeah. So you 
you missed out on invading Kwajalein, yes. Iwo Jima, yes. Okinawa. Yes. Luckily. Mm -hmm. So here you are, training in Guam for the invasion of Japan, and along comes August 45, yeah. and you hear the atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. I was uh, trained as a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. I fired an expert on the rifle range, so they made me <laughs> machine gunner. Now, how did you hear about the atomic bomb drops? <sighs> I don't know. Uh, was it radio, newspaper, or scuttlebutt? We didn't have any radio. Mm -hmm. uh, newspaper over there. I think it was just passed down. Okay. So no Japan? No. But you were sent somewhere. Tianjin and China. North China. That was to take this surrender of up to a quarter of a million Japanese troops in North China. Of course, the Chinese were involved in a civil war at that time between the communists and the nationalists. And along a lot of people don't realize that Russia never declared war on Japan or China. They were increasingly active in North China. So tell us a little bit about you being in northern China. You're definitely not like Guam. No. No. Was it like cold, windy? It was cold. Okay. <laughs> Especially coming from uh, the islands. Mm -hmm. And we landed in the port city of Taku, T A K U, and took a rickety old train ride up to Tianjin. This was in the First Marines mm -hmm. Regiment at the First Marine Division. And what were your duties? Were you still a machine gunner? Were you helping processing? Yeah, it was mainly keeping the railroad open between Tianjin, which was a city roughly the size of Boston population mm -hmm. and keeping the, the railroad open between Tianjin and the northern city of Chinwan Tao. I don't know how to spell that. <laughs> and That was right where the Great Wall of China meets the sea. 
and the communists were very active in we we take the train up there and find all of a sudden a couple of sections of railroad tracks missing of uh, things like that what about the uh the Japanese soldiers themselves were uh, were they shipped off? They were just kind of hanging around. What was happening to them? We were exporting them. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of civilian Japanese civilians living in North China ever since they invaded mm -hmm. China back in 1937, mm -hmm. I think it was. And was it uh, that area that was known as Benchuko? Or was this another part? Benchuko? Uh, oh, Man Manchuria. Oh, Manchuria, mm -hmm. Mongolia. Okay. Up, up in that area. And the Russians, Shortly after the atomic bombs were dropped, they invaded North China. And they, as we recall or heard about, they began stripping machinery out of the coal producing cities of Harbin and Mukden, M-U-K-G-E-N, I think it is, in North China. And we didn't know how fast the Russians were coming down, but they stopped at the Great Wall of China. Rich, did you ever have the feeling that you were kind of caught in the middle? Yes. Ah. In fact, uh, May 1st, 1946, mm -hmm. we were, our company was in Chenwan Tower, in an old castle, sleeping on a stone floor with sleeping bags. And you could look out the window and see the remnants of the Great Wall of China where it reached the sea. And I heard my name called up. Somersault, you're going home. <laughs> and a Jeep with a PFC driving and a Browning automatic rifle sitting. I was sitting in the back seat or in the rear with a giant American flag and we rushed during I think it was about 75 miles to Tintin to board ship and get my gear. So how long were you stationed in northern China? Uh, roughly January 1st. I can't remember exactly mm -hmm. until May 1st. 
and that is the communist birthday, which added to the tension. So you spent a winter and part of a spring in yes. northern China. Uh, did you ever meet any of the native population while you were stationed? Yes. And how were they? I met a Japanese family. He ran a steel company in in the area, I guess it was, and I remember they had saved up forty-five dollars in American money, and they trusted me with that if I could marry, mail it to them when I could because they were going to be on a ship, a Chinese ship, and they knew they were going to be strip searched. Their home, by the way, was Nagasaki, and I didn't have the heart to tell them. They didn't know anything about the atomic bombs. And I tried to mail it, but they just laughed at me. Oh. The, Well, let's get you on a ship, or did you get home by ship? Yes. 31 days it took to reach San Francisco, San Francisco <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh-huh. Wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. feeling that is. Were you uh, sent back to Camp Pendleton? Uh, yes, I think I did. Okay. And were you discharged from Camp Pendleton? No. No. Uh, Bainbridge, Maryland. Bainbridge, Maryland, okay. Uh, so you got to travel a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, they gave me a bus. Ticket to Philadelphia and New York, and those are the days mm -hmm. before air travel was popular. And I take it you've managed to make your way back to Natick? Yes. Okay. At the time of your discharge, what was your rank? Were you still a PFC? Corporal. You were a corporal, okay. Yeah. And when you were discharged, what did you do for work when, once you got back to Natick? I slept a lot <laughs> until my dad said, why didn't I go out and get a job? Mm -hmm. And I got a job as a draftsman at Victory Plastics in Hudson, Massachusetts. Just kind of curious, you uh, did you want to go back to MIT? Yes. But? <laughs> uh, but I went there and they quietly said there are 11 million GIs trying to get into college and were booked solidly for two years. And I was still 
corresponding to my newfound girl <laughs> and I married her <laughs> instead. The best decision I ever made. Uh, and what was your wife's name? Virginia. And was she from around here? She was in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Okay. So now you're a draftsman at Victory Plastics in Hudson. Mm -hmm. um, did you eventually go back to school at any point? No. No? I finally got a job well at Victory Plastic and they were having financial problems and then they took me at New England Prestige mm -hmm. at 90 cents an hour running a press. I gradually, over 40 some odd years, mm -hmm. wrote, rose to vice president. Did you take advantage of the GI Bill? No. No. Because of that. Not even to get a house? Did you get oh, a... Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. So as you mentioned earlier that you, you and your wife moved to Sherbin. Yes. In 1956. But before that, mm -hmm. we lived on Bacon Street in Natick, 223 Bacon Street. Mm -hmm. And it was an old house, and we w wanted to adopt a, another, another child, mm -hmm. but there weren't in the bedrooms. So we needed a, a larger house. So Rich, you were for a while living in Natick during the post-war boom. Yeah. Uh, can you describe what that was like? I was busy working. <laughs> oh, because, uh, well, for example, uh, Route 927 Mall was being built in the late 50s. Yeah. You had houses oh. going up all over the place. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just the way mm -hmm. it is now. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did, um, did you receive any medals or commendations? Uh, I received a letter from Harry Truman thanking me for my service and I think there were quite a few, <laughs> few that received that. Well, it's it's good to know he was thinking of you. Yeah. Yes. And a good conduct medal. All right. Did you join any um, military service organizations? I tried the Marine Corps League, which was very active. In 1946, but it it seems to fizzle out in just about a year. Mm -hmm. And excuse me. I wish I'd. Um, any other organization such as the VFW or Legion? No. 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 Okay. Did no. you uh, go to any reunions? No. No, no reunions. No. Okay, Rich, how important was it for you to serve in the military? It was just a thing to do, I guess.
And is there anything else before we wrap things up? Well, I matured mm -hmm. rapidly in the Marine Corps as every, everybody else did. And I, I don't know about other guys, but songs like God Bless America, that thing <laughs> brings, brings tears to my eyes. Okay, well, Richard Summersall, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Mm -hmm. Thank you.